Hello, this is uh, part two of low code app module. And in this section, we will be covering about case status, service level agreements, user guidance, uh, field group, field lists, as well as uh, calculations. How are they done in Pega? So the first thing that we are going to look at is the case status. Uh, earlier, we had looked at how to design a case life cycle. So, for this, I would still suggest that if you can have a look at part three and part four of my previous Pega Business Architect playlist, you will find much more content uh, than what is provided in 8.4. So, however, I will just do a quick recap over here. As you know, the case status indicates the case progress towards resolution. And you set the case status on either a stage or a step if you set the case status on a stage when the case advances to the stage the pega platform will automatically update the case status to as you have defined it in the final case life cycle stage you will find that there is a specific status called resolution status which is the case status after all the processes in the stage are complete in some cases, you might want to configure more specific case statuses at the step level. Step level is nothing but if you see in this picture, there is one, two and three written under uh, stage and process. So these are called the steps. So even on a step, you can configure a status and as uh, the user reaches that particular step at the beginning of the step, the case status would get updated. So when you set a case status on a step, the case advances to the step and as it reaches, the Pega platform will automatically update the status of the case to the value that you have defined in that particular step. At runtime, the case changes the status when the case reaches a point that you have defined. Other than that, there are standard case status values. There are only three of them that is open, pending approval, and resolved completed. There are some custom case status values. There are also three of them that you can use. It is pending processing, pending shipping, and order shipped. Here's a quick question that's provided in the chapter. So the question says, you're developing a case type that called assistance request that handles roadside assistance services. The assistance request case type has the following case life cycle. You want the case status to update at each major case milestone. Where in the following case life cycle do you configure the case statuses? I have provided the answer over here, but if you see uh, on the top, there is open, pending qualification, pending fulfillment and resolved completed. So these were the four options that were given. As we know, defaultly, the first status is going to be open and the last status would, of course, be resolved completed. So we were left with just two of them, which is pending qualification and pending fulfillment. Now, when I look at the process, which on the second stage, you can see it requires validate request, assign service request. So which means that it is actually validating and getting information. Thus, I have put here pending qualification. And in the third stage, the pending fulfillment. There are some standard rules that Pega provides. Uh, you do not have to remember all of them, but there are a couple of them that you can uh, remember especially the ones that work uh, that begin with dot py but i'll quickly run through these uh, update status it's basically an activity that changes the status of a case or based on the value which means it basically updates the status accordingly work basket so work basket as you know refers to a queue so it basically puts an assignment in a work queue and then calls for it work list it puts an assignment on a work list and then calls the work so now let me again uh, remind you what is work list and work queue uh, work list is basically the list of work available to a particular group work queue is your own personal queue where you have work 
uh, defined or you know ordered as per priority dot py status work it stores the current status of a case and dot uh, py elapsed status new basically this is a property that stores the cumulative time in seconds that the case has spent in any status with the uh, new prefix similarly py elapsed status open again this stores the cumulative time in seconds that has a case spent in any status with the prefix as open so for dot py elapsed status pending it just means the time in seconds that a particular case has spent with a prefix as pending so which means that how long has a particular case say spent in pending fulfillment has a user taken an hour before it reaches the second one which is result completed so that's basically the hour that is um, recorded and dot status result it's basically for a case that is resolved to communicate the status change to other business processes actually what it means is when it is reaches the state as resolved it is used to inform other business processes that it is completed now we're going to look at user guidance generally what is a user guidance it's basically providing instructions to users while they're engaging with an application uh, you want to for example place an order in an online shopping application and as you advance through the case and you do not receive instructions then what happens is the user lacks the guidance and sometimes can find it difficult to determine what is the meaning of that particular field what is the purpose of it and what information should be entered step instructions the are instructions that are provided at the step level they identify and help users accomplish uh, what is required of them in that particular assignment so we add instructions to steps that require users to enter information so user would see the instruction when receiving an input prompt in a form for example uh, there is a enter payment information step the application developers will add instruction saying that enter your credit card information or it could be like um, enter a billing address over there they, if you see sometimes there is a question mark near the a uh, field name and when you hover over the question mark you will see a detailed information saying that um, enter the address uh, of your credit card that is provided or it could be the enter the address where the product has to be shipped so these are the instructions and that is what pega refers to as user guidance so you are creating a case type that handles for example say the onboarding process for new employees now case life cycle uh, requirement which uh, step do you think would benefit from this instruction or where should we put this instruction that is the second question so if there is a case type which is about onboarding new uh, employees is most ideal place would be to add instructions in the collect information step where people have to enter say the employee's name date of birth manager department salary or any other information it could be even blood type address references so where is user in guidance given it is given where there is a lot of information being collected from the user that's exactly what user guidance refers to so now let's see uh two quizzes adding instructions to a step so adding instructions to a step describes the business value of the step no not really it does not describe the business value it actually provides important information that is valuable to the user to provide inputs adding instructions to a step defines the step which is option 2 no it doesn't define the step it just provides additional information uh third one 
describes to users the action to take in a step. This is exactly what we are looking at or is the purpose of adding instruction to a step. The last option is instructions and application developer how to build the step. No, I don't think instructions over here are given to the application developer. User guidance is all uh, done with the mindset for the customer or for the user. Now let's look at question two. A collect information step in the case lifecycle sets the status to pending approval. When does the case status automatically update? This question can be answered even without looking at the options because the case status always updates at the beginning of the step. So hovering through the four options that have been given. Cannot update automatically. No, it updates automatically when it reaches the beginning of the step. Option two updates at the end of the process containing the step. That is completely incorrect. Case status update at end of the step. Again, it is a deviation uh, from the option two, but is incorrect. So a case status always automatically updates at the beginning of the step. What type of step typically requires contextual instructions? So it's this question basically means that what type of instructions are set to a step and what type of step requires instructions it's basically anywhere where information is being collected so the option one is our right answer also after this session i would request that all of you can hover over to a playlist called pega challenges and over there you will see how to basically provide user guidance in an app studio it shows the practical way of doing it now let's look at service level agreements uh, i absolutely love the part uh, four and five where i have discussed about service level agreements in my pega business architect playlist that is beautifully um, provides more content but in this particular version the sla has not been uh, uh, gone into much detail but it covers the basics just as it was in the previous version so for uh, SLA is basically the deadline or it's the work completion deadline and organizations often establish SLAs to enforce on time performance. So what is SLA? So basically we have agreements, uh, people who work in uh, probably sales and uh, finance would have seen that there are contracts uh, where there is an end date. Uh, there are milestones in a project. If you are working in on a project, then there are milestones. Every probably say, you know, uh, sprint cycle, there is a basic uh, uh, mock up that you show to your client, which is nothing but a milestone. And so at the end of it, you have a timeline where you need to complete the project and there are different milestones. Similarly, in Pega, we would say that there are three milestones. The first is a goal. Goal is basically you would say as uh, the ultimate ultimate uh, amount of time or what is the amount of time time that you need to complete a task deadline is basically uh, you could say uh, the amount of time which is good to complete past deadline is basically that the deadline is over and it is past you have crossed the desired amount of time that is required to complete a task so what you do next you do next is an escalation action which could be triggering uh, an escalation email to your manager or escalating to the next employee uh, and after this there is something called get next work which we will look at shortly so service level agreements support a few intervals of time that standardize how long you have to perform a task or how long it takes to complete a case you configure sla's on case type stages processes and collect information or on approval steps so you can configure SLAs on stages, processes, as well as steps. But there are two kinds of steps that are most likely preferred to set SLA, which is approval 
or and collect information. Now, how do you uh, often there are umpteen number of tasks and how do you ensure that you do the right task, which is important? Basically prioritizing it and you prioritize it using a number. You give it a value, a numeric value, which in Pega is referred to as urgency. So the numeric value actually um, ranges from zero to hundred, zero being the least. 100 being the highest. Typically in PEGA, default value at the beginning of a case SLA is 10. Default urgency is 10. So higher the urgency value, higher the importance of that task. And thus, what you need to do is take up the task that has the highest urgency. And the maximum urgency can be 100. The PEGA platform get next work functionality basically assigns higher urgency tasks before assigning a lower urgency task so that you finish assignments that are of higher priority on time. So if you're between two or more assignments that the user needs to do, get next work will favor the assignment which has the greatest urgency. And escalation actions are actions that your application would take to facilitate faster resolution times based on your SLA. So you can configure escalation actions on SLAs to notify assignee, manager, participants, or reassign a task, or even resolve the case as the goal or deadline occurs, depending on what your business process is. But SLA is done with the whole goal that on-time performance as well as quality is maintained. So here we're going to look at capturing and presenting data. So when it comes to capturing and presenting data, what does it refer to? It basically means how is the information that is provided on forms by users collected, stored, and presented later on. So there could be a multiple amount of uh, information for a customer that is stored, but probably the customer needs to access it. So how do you present that information back to the user as well? So over here, for any user form, there is a diff there are different fields, and each field has a different type of data structure. So what do I mean by field? Basically, each field represents a data element and it stores a single value. So when you create a data element, you assign it a field type. The field type actually shows you what type of information is stored. Is it a text value? Is it an integer? Is it a currency? Is it a date or a time? Or is it a Boolean value? Is it a phone number? Is it an URL? So what is the type of information? So field type basically tells you what type of information is stored. So field, if you have to visualize this, it's nothing but the tabs like first name, second name, last name, middle name. These are the field names. And what kind of data can be fed into it is basically governed by field type. Because if in the first name, what happens is if you are the developer, you set the first name as a text field type. Sometimes you can have character limits too. So for example, if there's a phone number, we often see on web pages when you're entering a phone number, there are instructions provided to you saying that please do not add plus or other kind of symbols. Or sometimes when you enter a phone number there is, and click submit, there is a message that pops up saying that the phone number should be at least of 10 characters. So the, this is how uh, the data is ensured that the correct data is fed into the forms by specifying that particular field, what kind of field type it is. This is what is the whole concept about capturing and presenting data. And uh, in PEGA, what happens is uh, 
other than ensuring valid information is fed into the system and that the system actually displays also the data in the correct format for example if you if it's a currency field so there's a dollar value that you assign to it or you pro provide decimals so the 350.50 cents is shown accurately back and it doesn't misread or what happens when the application misreads it's for example if there's no decimal point there is no currency there could be miscalculation at a later stage so now we're diverging a little bit more into the types of field or field types uh, in 8.4 version there are only two field types that are mentioned that is simple and fancy that's why you will see that the complex is in red because in the earlier version complex was also mentioned as a field type however in this version they have taken it as a separate chapter itself or a separate lesson altogether or a mission so what are simple field types simple field types are the basic simple fields that we normally use which is a text integer currency date decimal boolean email url or a phone number now fancy is something where there is a little more addition that is you add a document to a email that is an attachment it's a fancy kind location for example you use the google maps or you know uh, there is also i think in sap lumira the geolocation tag so that is a fancy type or they can be a user reference user reference means what that is a particular field comes and you have the user reference given that is at xyz or you can say at arg which is basically you are adding a fancy user reference we also do this nowadays in email in email we add a at the rate and then type in the name of the person who we want to draw attention to so that's a fancy field type and we will look at the complex shortly but to just give you a quick overview here itself since field group and field list they just refer to nothing but a group of fields that are combined together or different single values combined together so, and we will have a look at this in this particular video towards the end so now like i said after setting instructions to your um, uh, steps you have provided the form to the user to fill in details now details have been also filled in correctly because you have actually written the data type structure correctly you have given the right inputs now how do you show it back what is the view that you can provide how do you now collect and present this data to the user so so to do so uh, basically you can ask yourself four questions or how do you show even a form an empty form how do you design an empty form how do you realize okay what are the different fields that are required for my user to fill in to do so you ask yourself four questions one what information basically the user needs to give second where can the can these fields or labels be editable or should they be only read only that is can the user just input or can they later on edit it also and how will they enter the value will they enter the value in a text format in an integer format in a decimal format or would it be a pick list where they just select what kind of value do they need to provide so these are a couple of questions that you ask yourself what fields are required are they editable how should the user enter the value and if the user can modify the values in the fields so accordingly how do you decide you basically create an excel kind of a table where you have name of the field and you analyze how do you enter and then you analyze if the user must enter may not enter or can be left as an option for example in web forms we have places where there is phone number there is email uh, there is also address and sometimes only the mobile number is required and email and address can be optional 
So each field actually corresponds to a data element and each data element stores a single value. When you create a data element, you assign it to a field type and the field type will identify the type of information. So this is basically to ensure that the valid information is put into the system. And there are three statuses or three things for user entry that you can consider required, optional or read only. Required is must be inputted, optional may be, read only means no inputs, just reading for um, the need of it, cannot edit. So let's look at quick question, uh, capturing data. Question one. You want users to choose their delivery preferences. The options are standard, premium, and next day. You use the data model tab to create field. Which field type do you use to define the delivery options? I'm going to give this question a go without actually even looking at the options because I can clearly see I have two clues from the question one delivery preferences so there are more than one preferences they have given me there are three and I need to choose so first my user needs to see what are the options available is it standard premium next day for example when you go on Amazon and you want to buy a product if you do not see while uh, you are you know at the shipping page, when will the product be shipped or what are your options? Do you pay 49 rupees to get a early delivery or do you pay 99 rupees to get uh, the same day delivery? So only if you see those options, can you pick, right? So I need to provide these three options to my user. So the user may input anything if I have not shown these options. So the user has to pick from these options. It's a pick list. Uh, I'm negating uh, the option two, which is a text or a paragraph because my user may not be even aware what are the option of delivery preferences that my company is providing. And the second one is user reference. Uh, well, I would not want me as a customer if I'm on Amazon and I'm trying to pick a delivery preference and it redirects me to a customer service and I have to wait for that person. It doesn't make sense. It's basically a cumbersome. Boolean is basically, as you know, picking either of them. So since there are three options, so I'm not going to choose it. If there were two, maybe I would have thought about it. Question number two, an applicant case captures the language skills of a candidate. What type of field do you configure for users to enter languages? Well, because here the options are given as text attachment and location, I have no other option but to pick a text because uh, the applicant just has to enter language skills. It does not say like, you know, attach language certification or anything of that sort so option two is out location doesn't make sense but i'm sure you would have seen in some forms where there is a pick list or a radio button drop down button where there are tons of languages mentioned and you pick one or sometimes there's an option of picking other and you key in the input in a text uh, box hence here the option is option one which is a text Third question for this section is to configure user views, you can add existing fields to the user view and so basically I'm create a table with field names. So I am trying to configure a user view. We already have existing fields and we have added them. What can we do? We can add instructions to an assignment, create a table or reuse saved views. So here we have to pick the best which is we can reuse the saved views so that the same views can be used as a template while configuring new user views and picking the best of them, which is the option two. And at the end of this, you can again jump over to the Pega challenges and have a look at how to basically provide, um, you know, field um, types, how to, uh, define the field types, how to basically ensure that you are providing users with, you know, with the right field types.
and the views. Uh, for example, over here, the view can be a horizontal panel or a vertical panel. If you see the first challenge uh, that I did, there was an option where we changed the pane from horizontal to vertical. That is also a part of a user view. Now we're going to look at data types. So to process cases, as we know, Pega platform uses different types of data and uh, it collects different kinds of information. So data types basically provide a way for developers to group a set of fields and thus thereby describe a single object. A data type consists of one or more single value fields, list or group of fields. The fields define the data structure. Collectively, different fields now represent a single type of object. For example, say there is a company and it, it's a recruitment company. So it has candidate data type with 30 fields. And these 30 fields can include, um, can be like first name, last name, address, email, phone, um, number or, um, or blood group. Uh, what is the graduation level? What is the degree level? So these are the fields and there is a candidate data type. It has so many fields. So you group all the fields under the candidate data type so that you know later on it can be accessed or reused as a template as well. So in addition to grouping data elements, data types can group objects, views also, and other rules can be created accordingly. So data types can reference other data types. Here uh, is an example where there's an account and using the account, you can do two things. One is transfer of funds or change address. So this account has a data model, model which includes account number, current balance, next statement date, as well as address. And all the data model is a composition or has been reused from these two types of data models, which is transfer and change address as well. So data types can reference other data types. Data types are basically templates that you can use anywhere. So in this, you see that you can reuse two case types, transfer funds and change address and make it into one. So account data type can reuse two case types and that is associated with the account. The fields that apply across different case types now include account number, balance, next statement date, and are saved to the account data type. So fields that are specific to each case type are saved now to an appropriate specialized data type. You can create data types to reuse assets from an existing one. You can source data types from external system, or you can source them from Pega platform system of record. Alternatively, data types can obtain data from a user, from a case participant who enters or changes during application processing. So if a data type, now let's look at what are the best practices. So we have actually covered three concepts over here, which is data inheritance. That is one data type can reuse different data types uh, from different uh, data models and create its own. Now, data type sourcing, it can source from Pega system of record, which is locally available, external system of record, which could be your CRM system or an external database system. Otherwise, you can also get information from the user who is accessing the application. Now, let's look at what are the best practices, what Pega offers you. So, Pega says that use standard commonly used data types that are available in Pega as much as possible. If there is one that is not available, then you create one. If there is one that partially meets, then what do you do? You extend that data type. For example, if you want to create employee data type, you can extend the existing person data type to create person employee data type because a person can have fields that can be used by the employee data type, such as first name, last name, phone number. So you can, this is how you can extend a particular data type to accommodate. 
So here is a question which just basically checks the source, data source. So here the question says, you're building a new customer service application with a case type that allows customers to submit feedback. So customer here submits feedback and that they placed with the orders that they placed with a legacy product application. So there is a legacy product application, which means this is an product application is external. Customers can specify their preference. So customer is providing the preference. So customer is inputting the preference. There is an external product application that is already available. So these are the two things that we have already identified. The following data types are necessary. Customer, for customer information and their order history. Product, feedback and preference. So if you have a go, preference, we'll begin from the last one. Preference is provided by the user. So it should be a no system of record. Feedback for customers to specify type of feedback that they submit and to enter a short description of their feedback. So feedback is a template that is available in Pega. So I would send it to Pega platform system of record because once the feedback is also obtained, it needs to be stored for further analysis. It's not something that can be just washed away. Now we already know that there is a legacy product application. So this is external system of record. There's customer information and their order history. So this will also be an external system of record because one customer will of course input, but you need to store the customer information, first name, last name, and also maybe you need to check their order history. So when you have to check their order history, it could either be in the order management system. So this has to be an external system of record. This is the solution. And like mentioned, I will again recap. The feedback data type values are defined by PEGA, therefore sourced by PEGA. Product and customer data types should use the external system already mentioned in the question as legacy system. The product and customer should use, uh, that's why the external system of record. The preference data type is useful for application display. And hence, this is a no system of record. Now here again, we are actually trying to figure out what is the difference between field and data type. Now field is basically like I mentioned something like first name, last name and stuff like that. Data type is actually comprising of a lot of information. So let's have a look at this question. You have an airline reservation case type that displays various flight options. Users can see potential flights which are identified by flight number, departure, arrival, and flight price. The case type also displays the flight that you select. Which objects are data types and which are individual fields? So basically you have to uh, picturize this as a web page. So if I'm an user and I'm trying to select a flight, I have different fields that I need to look at. What is the price? Is the price within my uh, budget? Departure and arrival codes. Again, I need to be sure from where am I traveling? to which city am I going? So that's again a field. Fi flight number. So there are different flight numbers that um, can pop up. You might be also checking uh, a status of a flight. So this is again a field. So the data type over here is potential flight because once you have selected all these parameters, there's a flight option that you will be provided with or selected or selected flight option that we provided for example in this question you can see there is the code given there's the value given so there's a departure arrival and the code and the value so hence 
potential flight is a data type that comprises of these three fields. So now here is uh, basically, can you differentiate? This question checks, can you differentiate between case type data types and the hierarchy level? So you're designing a customer support request. The case type needs to support customers with multiple address and multiple credit cards. What is the appropriate way to set up the data structure? This question is a repeat. They haven't changed this question for a very, very long time. In most of all the Pega versions, this question is mentioned. So I think this is a very permanent question and you can actually hope to get a question on this line in your exam as well. I've seen questions of this kind in almost all of the PCB and PCSA exams. So coming back to the question, uh, this question basically gives you all the information. My best approach to answering anything in PEGA exam is actually to look at the question and then to negate. So you're designing a customer support request case type. So this already gives the first level, which is customer support request case type. So I am creating a support request as a case type here. The case type needs to support multiple cards and multiple credits. So data type here is going to be customer. Case type is support request. And over the in the last level, it would be multiple addresses or credit card. So support request case type, customer data type, and then credit card and address because the customer can take credit card information and addresses from these two particular data types and create its own as well. The question over here was basically to match again the source. So I have already matched and provided the solution, but I'll let you know why I have. A company uses a PEGA platform for job application and referrals. Available position data type include fields for position title, description, qualification. The job application, job referral case type support the data type. So it's saying the job application and job referral, just as in the previous question, we had multiple addresses and credit cards. They support this data type. And these are the fields and this needs to be filled in by the applicant. So basically this is a, this can be obtained from Pega platform system of record because Pega has a template for all these. And there are two case types that are supporting, which means this is already available in Pega platform system of record and we are going to utilize it. So over here, there's an auto repair shop is using Pega to schedule appointments. Vehicle data type includes fields you obtain from an industry database. That is our clue. You can obtain from an industry database, which is external. It could be even from a web page, but it is an external system of record. Now, looking at this, an HR application has expense. So the expense report has date, data type where employee can enter date type amount and description. So since the employee enters, it's a no system of record. Over here in this question, actually the last line clearly tells you what kind of sourcing it is. For example, an option two, industry database, hence external. Employee option three, employee enters, so no system. And over here, job application and case types are supporting the data type, hence it's Pega system of record. Now we're looking at field group list. So field group list is a single entity that contains multiple fields. By now you should be aware of what is a field. A field is nothing but the label that you see on a web page or a web form. That is first name, second name, last name. These are fields and a field group is a single entity that can contain multiple fields. For example, that can be, say you have an Amazon Prime account. So an Amazon Prime account will have the have your details such as first name, last name and email. And all these are multiple fields which can be grouped together under customer data type. 
so why are we actually grouping we are grouping so that later on when you have to use for any 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 kind of function or to analyze you can actually have a field group from where you can get the maximum information so when amazon will have a field group list is when the customer field group will have records of different customers so you can imagine that a customer field group is having multiple fields and when you group these multiple fields for different users it becomes a customer field group so for amazon prime account the customer field group which comprises of lists of these lists of field groups will become basically a group list so you can also configure a field group list to allow end users to add delete or update as needed but a customer field group or a field group cannot be edited only a field group list can be edited deleted they can be addition or you can also update so a field group can contain field group lists too example here is that there is a customer and the customer can have umpteen number of credit cards or a combination of credit and debit cards saved in their own amazon account so i will just reiterate first is field group second is field group list and field group list can undergo addition deletion and updation field group cannot field group has different fields now here is a quick quiz time so this is basically to check do you understand the difference between field group and field group list please remember this example first name last name email becomes a field group when there are 100 customers with this data that particular thing becomes a field group list so let's look at this what is a field group let's look at the first example enter primary driver or a, on an insurance form so this is a single entry single value i'm going to just enter a primary driver name maybe so i'm going to assign it to field group now the second one is display hotel name average rating and price per night here my clue is hotels names which means there are different hotels and there are multiple fields and so it could be 100 hotels with their name rating and price hence this is a list and it goes to field group list the second one that's given over here is uh, enter interviewers and scheduling information for each candidate so which means there are different interviewers and there is different information about their timing this is again a list the option number 4 which they have given display job applicants work history now this again is a field group list because a job applicant may have a uh, worked in one company or 10 different companies or 100 so it's a list enter vehicle information for an insurance claim so over here i need to enter this is just one form and i'm entering insurance claim for example you are entering uh, or you are claiming an insurance for your vehicle so you go on web page and enter details of your vehicle which is a single one thus it's a field group this is the solution now we are looking at a couple of other questions as well so in a loan request candidates must enter their addresses from past 10 years what field do you type do you configure so since again this is different addresses for 10 years so there will be multiple uh, i would say items hence this is a field group list we don't use fancy field because fancy field is for attachment location and user reference a field group should have only probably one entry a series of single line text field doesn't make sense because that will be cumbersome because we would want to group all the related items hence it is a field group list 
What is the difference between a field group and a field group list? A field group stores values of a group of related properties or related fields. In PEGA, properties and fields are interchangeably used. A field group list stores a list of grouped values. So a field group is a single entity. Example given here is online ordering application. The customer is an example of field group that contains fields such as customer name and contact information. Now a field group list is a list of grouped items. The line items that make a purchase request is an example of field group list. So list is a group and field group is just a single entity comprising of different fields. Now we're going to go a little more ahead and see the use of calculations. So the calculations can be done in two kinds, functions and custom. Functions are applied to field group lists only. Custom calculations are done on simple or fancy data types. So functions iterate over items in a field group list while custom calculations can reference any combination of simple and fancy. So you use a calculated field as an input to another calculation and you can create a network of dependent calculations as well. So why do we need to calculate? Why are we talking about calculating? Because like you know, there is a key thing uh, that needs to be presented to the user as well as uh, there is an operation of um, you know using different types of data for calculating in a web page the example is that of a checkout uh, page where you need to probably calculate what is the amount that the user needs to pay for the shopping that they have done again using the example of amazon you would have selected five items or you would have selected say totally seven items but one item you would have ordered probably for three quantities so why do you calculate basically we calculate automatically so that you know one there is no manual error second if it is automatic if there is any change in any field of the input value this will again change let me put up a pointer over here earlier in um, pega earlier version there was there were terms like trigger source which is has been removed in this version and they've made it very simple as of now so basically we calculate to reduce manual errors as well as to ensure that automatically all fields are updated whenever there's a change in input and function calculations are done on fgl or field group list and custom calculations are done on simple and fancy that is you do a calculation uh, such as addition or subtraction or uh, you know you calculate what is the total value on um, probably uh, whatever currency decimal or whatever input has been given so for functions we're going a little bit over here so in functions there are four major operations that you can do one is sum of which is to add all instances of a specified property in a field group list again reminding you functions are done only on fgl or field group list here example is that of a shopping uh, cart so in a shopping cart you add all instances of all the fields and give a sum now this is average of for example, you want to figure out what is the customer spending pattern. Uh, so in that case, you want to calculate the average value. So what is the average of? Or you want to calculate, you know, what is, uh, say in New York, uh, what is the average spending of all users or of, of, or of all shoppers that visit uh, probably Walmart or whichever. So in that case, you do an average of. This is, there is something called minimum of and maximum of. Minimum of is basically to determine the smallest value. For example, at a checkout page, say there is a, a sale going on where the value 
the of an item which is the lowest is given for free to you so in that case you determine minimum of maximum is to determine the highest value so what happens is uh, for example um, there is a promo code given to you you have three discount coupons but you actually can use on your checkout page only one discount co coupon which probably has the maximum value so uh, there is some of average of minimum and maximum of functions that are done on field group list now custom in custom you define calculation for simple field except for an email phone and a pick list so you basically cannot add subtract or divide or multiplicate a phone number email or you know grab information from a pick list so other than this custom function uh, custom calculations such as division grouping multiplication boolean and or boolean or can be done on text also you can do uh, these calculations with a process called concatenation so what happens in a simple and a fancy field you can actually create a calculation net a network for example the first step would be to calculate the total quantity the second step could be to calculate the price so you can have one laptop which would be say 40000 into 1 which is 40000 step 2 is probably you know to calculate the total of all these step 3 could be to add gst then the step 4 is the final checkout so here is what they have shown an example of how you can do calculation on text so the example states that an appraisal firm offers to estimate value of items from customers who submit an item for review and the firm can add a comment as well noting the following information so you are on a web page you want to find out what is the value it's basically like you know you go to a pawn shop and you want to figure out how much will they pay you for so in that case it can be done on the web page without any involvement of a person so how do you divide it? how do you do the calculation for these things is you enclose a quotation mark so appraiser plus dot appraiser id will give you the id number over here again a plus symbol again the quotation mark so whatever is on the quotation mark will be just typed the same way this goes back to our logic in java where there was printf quotation mark is this so whatever is under the quotation mark will just be typed the same way or printed the same way and whatever is with dot item name will actually be taken from the field inputs that has been given either by the user or by the tables that have recorded it so we will see the final input as something like this appraisers 04795 appraised silver platter the silver platters come from the user information at a value of 350 this is probably calculated from you know different calculation networks on and the date is given so basically calculation network will also help you identify the relation between different fields so when you define a field calculation pega will add that calculation to calculation network and this will help to update all relevant fields whenever there is a change in value looking at uh, the last two questions for this video which two of the following are use cases for calculated fields configured with functions since here the keyword is functions it has to be a field group list which means it cannot be a single entity but a collection of different field groups hence looking at the options i am going with first the option 2 the a grouping supervisor tracks amount of time that work has spent as users enter duration the cumulative total calculates the duration fields are single input fields so we can clearly see it's a single input field plus it's just a addition total thus this is not a function this is a custom calculation option 3 online ordering application calculates cost for each item type by multiplying quantity by unit price so this is again a very simple custom calculation that is quantity into the number of items into the price basically will give a total now let's look at option 1 what is the difference here 
Again, it is the same thing as the option 2, but here you can see that the cumulative total calculates in another field, but what is given over here is the duration fields are in a field group list. So since field group list is mentioned, I'm going to pick this as a function. I'll need a function calculation to do it for anything for FGL. An online ordering option 3, which is an online ordering application calculates cost for each type by multiplying the quantity by unit price. Sorry, we've already done this. The last option, a testing facility wants to know the average score for each test that the facility provides. By test, you can create a test score list and then use the calculation to generate the results. It clearly says that we are just trying to find first. There are two clues again in this question. First is the word average score. Average can be done only by function calculation. The second uh, clue over here is a test score list, which means there's a list of test scores and hence this is a field group list as well. So considering these two clues provided in the answer, option one and option four are the best options to choose. Now over here, uh, these are two questions. A ticket seller requires a calculated field to find the total cost of sales tax, processing fee, uh, complete the calculation. So basically it's an addition process where with the subtotal is nothing but a total of processing fee and total of taxes. What two items describe the function of a calculation network? So we are going to try to define why are we using calculation network as specified in this one it is to identify the relationship between fields and the second is to automatically update whenever there's a change in value this is the end of uh, a major portion and at the end of this you can hover over to your challenge to see basically how to do these calculations practically in app studio thank you and have a great day ahead